It is Thursday, and that's when we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergen from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're as plugged in to some of the data that we've been seeing as anybody in the city and county right now. What is the data telling you? Are you seeing hopeful signs, or are you still thinking we haven't reached that peak yet? Right. So it's a mixed bag. Um, let me start with a reality check. You know, we, we use a model. I've shown you examples of how that model predicts our curve um, in the coming weeks. And it's from a very, very reputable company that works with a lot of academic medical centers around the country to help with strategic planning. And we call it the SG2 model. Our SG2 model is suggesting that we are just about at peak, but that we are going to stay at the peak. So can think of it as a high plateau. And we may stay at this level until about the end of July to early August. So this is, it, the good news is we don't seem to be rising, rising, rising at 10% per day as was happening in the recent weeks. Um, with the, the rate of rise has slowed, has leveled off. But you know our hospitals are just about at their capacity. And the, it, the model predicts that we're going to stay there for the next two, even three weeks. So this means we cannot back off. It means that the measures we've been taking by raising awareness um, and asking people to uh, prevent and protect and provide information to the contact tracers, those three Ps, that campaign is having an effect, but we're not out of the woods and we cannot let our guard down. And we're still not two weeks out from the July 4th holiday weekend. Why is that something that's important for us to just continue to slow down, maintain these precautions, keep those up? Uh, why is that timeline something that we really need to be cautious about? So we, we, our model that I just described for you with my words is actually taking into account the possibility that 4th of July resulted in some increased exposures. But because people don't actually become ill enough to go to the hospital with COVID until about two weeks after they were infected, um, we still worry that anything that happened on July 4th wouldn't be evident from the hospital perspective until about the 18th or beyond of July. Okay, so we're talking like probably about 10 days, nine days from now when we'll start seeing some of the effects of the fourth weekend. Okay, talk about um, schools and schools reopening and some, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics had some recommendations, the CDC had some recommendations. What do you, what are your thoughts about schools reopening in either in-person or uh, distance learning? Right. Well, I am in line with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I think for many, many reasons, school needs to be available. Um, many families uh, don't have alternative options. They can't do uh, expensive stay-home schooling. They they need child care. They need their kids to go to school so they can go to work, and we all understand how critical that is for the economy. So I believe in school, but we need to have it be done safely. And there are many measures that could be implemented at individual schools and in individual classrooms that could really increase the safety of sending kids back to school. And I think we're going to work hard as a community to get the word out there and do a lot of education of both parents, well, and their children, families and schools and teachers to see how we can do this as safely as possible. What do you think safely as possible looks like right now from your perspective? What would you like to see happen in schools? So let's remember the, the principles of how we mitigate infectious risk with, with COVID-19. And we ask the question, how many, how close, how long, and how modifiable? Those four questions. How many people are you with? How close are you to them? How long are you in close proximity? And how modifiable is the activity? And so for every single thing that's being done in a school, those four questions should be asked. So reducing classroom sizes, increasing the space between the kids and uh, looking at what kind of activities are being done. We don't want singing 
and we don't want wind instruments, and we don't want close contact sports. Uh, we would love to see small groups, small classes being uh, carried out, say, in large spaces such as gymnasiums, or even if it's cool enough, if there's a shady place, having classes outdoors. We don't want to see groups of kids intermingling. So we want to see a small group of kids that are staying with the same group and the same teacher all day long without um, mixing through the rest of the institution. We want to see them eating their lunches in their classroom and bringing their lunch from home. We'd like to see staggered drop-off and pick-up times so that we don't have areas of congestion where people are shoulder to shoulder coming into or going out of the school. And of course, hand hygiene needs to be everywhere. Ideally, masking. And this is going to be tough for the smaller children, but there may be other options that can really help us for those kindergartners and those first graders who might find it scary to be in a classroom full of masked people where there are now face shields that come down over, then go to below the chin and around the sides of the face and, and cover the eyes. Those are not as good. They're not as protective as the face mask, but they do provide some protection. And there is some scientific evidence of that. And that might be some sort of an interim measure, especially for the younger kids that would help make them safer. Unfortunately, when we go back to the data, I, we've been seeing a number of deaths over the last you know, week or so that have been way more than we've seen in the past. And today they included 13 deaths that were uh, previously unreported that were part of a postmortem report. Is that a trend that you think we're going to continue to see? Well, it's un unfortunately, um, there will be deaths. You know, when we have this high occupancy rate of our hospitals, uh, with people that are really sick, you are going to see some deaths. We try to mitigate that risk by implementing the, our new knowledge of how to use a steroid called dexamethasone, how to use the antiviral drug remdesivir. But even remdesivir is in very short supply, and we have been learning how to use it most effectively. If we use it too early before a person has a real oxygen deficit, then we may be wasting it because those might be people that would have gotten better on their own. And if we wait too late, if somebody's already been intubated or needing ECMO, that extracorporeal membrane oxygenation support, at that point in time, it's usually too late. So we need to identify um, who could benefit best from this. And that requires a lot of good judgment and requires a lot of timely responsiveness in our emergency room. So all of these things have to come together nicely and in an organized and synchronized fashion for us to reduce mortality. And you know, of course, if the hospitals are overwhelmed, if the emergencies are overrun, it's hard to synchronize everything and do things in, in a timely way. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. As always, thanks for being with us this evening. Happy to be with you. We'll be right back.